We're in this series called Believe, and it's been a really good series. It's a good series for people who are exploring Christianity and want to know some of the basics of Christianity. In fact, I've heard from at least one person, two people saying, you know what? I'm going to keep this book and I'm going to save these materials because this is great discipling material because it goes through the basics of Christianity and what Christianity is all about, what we should believe, how we should act, and who are we trying to become. So the first 10 weeks was all about thinking. What do we believe? We want to think like Jesus. And here's the topics we went through. These are just core essential doctrines of the Christian faith. I'm not going to go through them again right now. Don't worry. But these are things we talked about. And these, these are things that are really build our faith. we got to know what we believe about at least these things. At a bare minimum, these are the essentials. And then we said, well we got to talk about if Jesus, we want to be like Jesus, we had to do the things that Jesus did. We want to act like Jesus. And we talked about these spiritual practices, about worship and prayer, about studying our Bible and, and being single-mindedly focused on following God and obeying Jesus. All these things we talked about. And today we are turning a corner. Today we're going to talk about 10 spiritual fruit and you'll recognize some of these from that scripture in Galatians that talks about the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. A lot of you know those. These are, these are spiritual fruit. These are spiritual virtues that everybody wants to be. This is who we want to become. I would say that even if you're not interested in following Jesus, you want to be this kind of person. I would say person who is an atheist wants to have love and joy and peace, right? I mean, this is the kind of person anybody wants to become. But our goal is to be like Jesus, to be more like Jesus. So these are spiritual fruit, and we're going to get into that. And I thought a good way, a fun way to introduce our first spiritual fruit is by having a little contest. And so we're going to talk about some love songs. And I was going to ask for a volunteer, but I've learned over the years, anytime I ask for a volunteer, there's one person whose hand shoots up first, and it's Mark Enoch. So I'm going to ask for volunteers. I'm going to tell Mark. <laughs> Go on up here, Mark. Okay, here's the contest. Uh, and I got to tell you, when I was working on this, I had a lot of fun with this because I have 21 love songs. 21. Because this is chapter 21 in the series, in the Believe Book. That, no, it just happened that way. Um, but I had a lot because these are, these are classics from the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s when music was music. Okay? <laughs> and, well, the 70s, okay, that was a hiccup. But uh, we got some good songs in here, and they're little clips. And Mark's job is to listen to the clip and finish the words. And most of these, I've narrowed it down to the, to the title of the song, but not every one of them. But they're all about love. If, you, if I were going to get a make my own mixtape of love songs, man, these 21 would be on my mix. Okay? They're great. I had so much fun putting this together. I couldn't just do a little clip. I had to listen to every one of them because all these memories come flooding in, this nostalgia. I'm like, oh, man, I love this song. I, I've already got my little clip, but I got to listen to the whole thing. I just love it. Okay? Are you ready, Mark? I'm ready. You understand what your job is? I really just came up here to take my mask off. <laughs> we could use a little bit more Mark probably in the mic here. Yeah. Because I'm we loud. I always use more Mark. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here's the first one. One, two, three. Love and marriage. Love and marriage. Good, you're good. Goes together. I'm going to have to cut him off every time, though. We're good. Here's the second one. Good. Y'all know it? Go. Some say love, it is a river. Good, good. That's good. Awesome. All right, here we go. Love is a battlefield. Good. All right. We need is love. 
All right, here we go. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Yeah, you guys can sing with him. It's okay. All right. Please do. Here we go. And I... Look at me in the eyes. We'll always love you. <laughs> That's right. All right. Here we go. And look at your wife on this one. You know what? All right, all right. You will always be my endless love. Mm -hmm. If you get this wrong, I'm going to do this wrong. I'm going to love you forever and ever, forever and ever. Amen. Here we go. Ready for a place called love. Oh, but crazy little thing called it, yeah, 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 crazy little thing called love. Here we go. Yeah. Come on, Lisa. I, I love is come along. You know that? Etta James. Oh, man, at last. That's awesome. You need to learn that one. Here we go. And crazy for crying. And crazy for loving you. All right. Yeah, I had to go through the song more. Yeah. <laughs> I just called to say I love you. Mm -hmm. the I can't stop loving you. Good. You're right. Play that one again. I don't know if I can do that. Okay. <laughs> Go into the, the chapel, chapel and we're gonna get married. Go into the chapel of love. There we go. Okay. All right. Here we go. And it's me you need to share. <laughs> I got some Bee Gees fans out here. Do you have that high pitch? How deep is your love? Okay. That I love you. There you go. Uh huh. Rod Stewart. Rod Stewart. I'm really disappointed on this one if you miss it. Hell, falling in love with you. All right, there's another Elvis one coming up. You got to redeem yourself here in a minute. This is not it. Love me. There you go. Okay. <laughs> All right, got two more. Go. For you. Okay, save it on my love for you. Okay. And last one. Till the end. Everybody's gonna have to sing on this one. Love me tender. Love me true, all my dreams fulfilled. Come on, ready for my darling. For my darling, I love you, and I always will. Good job. Let's hear it for Mark. Woo. So I think it's obvious which virtue we're going to be talking about today. It is the virtue of love. And it's the greatest of all the virtues. In fact, Jesus said it's the greatest of all the commandments. He said the whole prophets and uh, the whole Old Testament summed up in 
these commandments. He said, the most important one is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second greatest one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And then he said again, that was in Mark, uh, Mark chapter 12, by the way. He said again in John chapter 13, a new command I give you. Here it is. Love one another. Well, that's not new. That, that was in the Old Testament, love one another. But he, he, he puts a little twist on it. Jesus says, as I have loved you. That's the new part. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And then again in John chapter 15, he says, My command, it's a command. The greatest command is to love God and love your neighbor. And Jesus turns around and says, My command is to do this. Love each other as I have loved you. So, how does Jesus love? If the command is for us to love as Jesus loves, how does Jesus love? It's a unique kind of love. I've narrowed it down to four things. We could go a lot more than this because it's a very distinct, unique love. But I've narrowed it down to four things. Number one, it's an unconditional love. And a lot of those songs we just sang, if you look at the, all the lyrics, it's not really about unconditional love. A lot of it is very selfish or conditional. It's like, do you love me now that I can dance? <laughs> Look at the song. <laughs> do you love me? It's, it's about, okay, I got my moves down. Now, do you love me? You know, the, we, we know about conditional love and selfish love. And a lot of that is about, I want you. I need you, right? You fulfill me. And it's a selfish kind of love. It's a desire we know about that kind of love. We know about conditional love. We know about uh, people not loving us because we didn't live up to their expectations. But Jesus' love is unconditional. And he says, you need to love those who are the worst. And you need to love those who are the least. Those who are against you, your enemies... And also those who have nothing to give back to you. They're the least. Here's what he says. Uh, by the way, some, a lot of times I, I preach and I use just one or two scriptures. And I, actually, that's my preference. Today, bam, bam, bam. They're coming at you, okay? They're coming at you. But they're very familiar verses if you've been uh, in church for very long. He's, he says you got to love the words. Unconditional. This is in Luke chapter 6. He says, but to you who are listening, I say this, love your what? Enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. Jesus says it's unconditional. You don't love someone just because what they can do back for you. It doesn't matter what they can do for you. Even sinners treat each other nicely if they're going to be treated nicely. Then he says, and if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Love the worst. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. In other words, we're supposed to be like God. God is merciful. God is kind to the wicked. So therefore, we should be kind to the wicked. We are called to love the worst, to love our enemies. Be merciful just as your Father in heaven is merciful. And that's in Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 27. 
And he's not done. He says, not only should you love the worst, you should love your enemies and those who persecute you. You should also love the least. And this is from Matthew 25, the, the end where Jesus is talking about the sheep and the goat and separating the sheep and the goat. And he's, to the sheep, he's, he says, you come into my kingdom because whenever you saw me, you took care of me. When I was hungry, you gave me food. You know that verse, here it is. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry? and feed you, or thirsty, and give you something to drink? When do we see you, a stranger, and invite you in, or needing clothes, and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison, and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Jesus says you love those who are, who are the least, and you love those who are the worst. Those who are not going to pay you back for your love because they're your enemies. In fact, they may give you, they may repay hurt when you love them. You love the worst. And you love those who can't repay you. They're unable to. The sick, the hungry, the thirsty, the ones in prison, the needy, the poor. We love the worst and we love the least. That is unconditional love right there. Because we're not going to get anything back from them. And then Jesus says, his love is selfless. It's unconditional and it's selfless. Now, we can go to a lot of scriptures for this, but my favorite verse when talking about Jesus being selfless is Philippians chapter 2, where Paul is saying, hey, you need to have the same mind as Christ. Do you remember that? He says, in fact, he says this, do nothing out of selfish ambition, or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not only looking to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Paul says, it's about other people. It's about selfless love. And then he patterns it after Jesus. Jesus left everything in heaven. He left his glory. He left his position. He left his, his benefits and blessings of heaven emptied himself, made himself nothing, became a human, not just a human, but a servant to the very people he created. If that's not selfless love, what is? He put everything on hold for others. And Paul says in Philippians, we're supposed to be the, show the same humility, the same selfless love. And we're supposed to follow Christ's example. So it's unconditional it's selfless, and it's sacrificial. That's the third thing, sacrificial. Jesus said himself, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends, to sacrifice. Now, we, it's common. We expect a good, loving mom or dad to sacrifice for the kids, don't we? I mean, We've heard stories, we've seen movies, we know situations where a mom or dad has sacrificed everything to save their kid. Kid is in the street, and there's a bus coming, and the parent throws, you know, jumps out there, throws the kid out, and the parent gets hit. We see that in movies, that's a common theme, not just for parents, but anybody who loves people. This is the kind of love that Jesus wants us to have, a sacrificial love. Parents lay down their lives for the kids. Good parents lay down, and not just throwing themselves in front of a bus. You heard stories about women in labor, and the doctor says, you're not going to make it. One of you is going to make it through the surgery, the baby or the mom. And the mom says, the baby. The baby will make it through. And she sacrifices herself so that the baby may live. Sacrificial love. And not just dying. Good parents sacrifice all the time for their kids. And we sacrifice for the people we love, don't we? Yes, we do. It doesn't just have to be a mom and a dad and a child. With the love of Jesus in us, then we have a sacrificial love. First John, by the way, if you want to... If you want to learn about the love of Jesus, the place to go is the Gospel of John 
and then the letters of John. That's the go-to place in the New Testament. John is known as the disciple of love. So a lot of our verses are coming from the Gospel of John and 1 John. So much in there about love and God is love and how we're supposed to love other people. So 1 John 3.16 says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for us. He laid down his life for us, sacrificial love. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Let us lay down our lives. And one way, example he says to do that is with our material possessions. We sacrifice our material things because we love with a sacrificial love. God's love, Jesus' love is unconditional. It is selfless and it is sacrificial. And the fourth thing, it is a forgiving love. It's a continually forgiving love. Another place to go in the New Testament that we all like to turn to when we're talking about love is 1 Corinthians 13. That's kind of the section that is kind of, we say, is the definition of, of agape love, God's kind of love. And there's a list in there that says, love is this, love is this, love is not this, love is not this. And one of the things Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 is that the love of God, the agape love of God, keeps no records of wrongs. So God's love, the love of Jesus, is a forgiving love. And in Colossians, Paul says this, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, those are all fruits of the Spirit that we're going to be talking about as we go through here. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If anyone has a grievance against someone, forgive. How? As the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Well, how has the Lord forgiven you? How many times has the Lord forgiven you? Oh, I heard a good answer every time. I heard another answer more than I deserve. Those are both really good answers. Can we count how many times the Lord has forgiven us? No. Over and over and over again. God forgives. He forgives. He forgives. Because that's the kind of love he has. That's the kind of love we are supposed to emulate. We're supposed to forgive as the Lord forgave you and forgave me. And this forgive is... In the Greek, it's a, it's a present participle for you grammar nerds, which means it's not a one and done. It's a continual forgiving. He continues to forgive over and over and over again. He says this in, in Matthew when Peter comes to him. He says, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Peter's being generous here. All right? He's, he's like coming to Jesus going, I think I got the answer to this. I think you already know it. It's like up to seven times, right? And Jesus says, not quite, Peter. <laughs> Is that how God forgives you, Peter? Up to seven times? And then what's next? Nope, not seven times. Forget it. Jesus says, I tell you, not seven times, come on now, but 77 times, or some translations read 70 times seven times. And you know, seven is that number of perfection in the Bible. So Jesus, is, Peter's saying, that's completion right there. If I do it seven times, I've completed and I've, I've done my job. 
And Jesus says, oh, no, 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 this is like infinity perfection. It goes on and on. It never stops. It's 77 times or 7 times 70. It just goes on and on because God forgives. Jesus forgives. And we are called to forgive as Jesus forgives. So the love of Jesus is very special. It's very unique. It's unconditional. It is selfless. It is sacrificial. And it is forgiving. And Jesus' command to us is to love one another as I have loved you. Can you love like this? Can you love like this? Can you love with an unconditional, selfless, sacrificial, forgiving love? How in the world am I supposed to live up to that? How can I do that? The answer? I can't. I am unable to love people with that kind of love. On a continual basis, forget it. I might have my high points every once in a while, but if it's up to me, you're not getting this kind of love from me. My kids don't get this kind of love from me. My wife doesn't get this kind of love from me if I'm striving on my own. Now, when we talk about the fruits of the Spirit for the next nine weeks, these virtues, what it means, what it looks like to become like Jesus, none of them can we do on our own, by our own willpower. These are not things you strap on your boots and then pull yourself up. This can only be done through Jesus. And he said that. Look what Jesus, Jesus says in John 15. We keep coming back to John 15 and John 13. Jesus said, remain in me as I also remain in you. I should have highlighted that part too. That's as important, if not more important. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the way, you are the branches. If, he, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And you know this example, this metaphor of fruit growing on the vine. Fruit can't grow unless it's connected to the vine. It's where it draws its nutrients. It's dependent. How do we love with this kind of love? How do we love people with this Jesus kind of love? The first thing we have to do is remain in Jesus. Connected to Jesus. Continually drawing from Jesus the nutrients we need to become like Jesus. He is our source. He's the well where we drink from. He's the heart that pumps blood through our veins. We can't disconnect ourselves from him. Continually remain in Jesus. And then John 15, uh, still in the same chapter, we're going to skip ahead to verse 9, says this. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. Now, there's a catch here, okay? Remaining in Jesus partly means to keep the commandments of Jesus. And you say, well, that, that sounds legalistic to me. Well, what did Jesus just say? Jesus said, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. If Jesus remains in the Father's love by keeping His commands, guess what? There's probably something in there for you and I. For me, I need to keep his commands in order to stay connected to him. Does that make sense? It's not dependent. My salvation is not dependent on me keeping his commands. That's by grace. 
But if I want to become more and more like Jesus, I have to stay connected to Jesus, and I remain in him by fulfilling, completing, obeying his commands, just like Jesus did with his Father's commands. My command is this. He gives it again. Love each other as I have loved you. And again, skip ahead a few more verses in John chapter 15. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. So that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. Now these verses are going to apply to all the virtues that we're going to be talking about. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, all those things, humility, is going to be applied to all those things. Because none of that fruit can be produced if we disconnect ourselves from Jesus. We have to remain in Jesus. And part of remaining in Jesus is doing the things that Jesus did and obeying his commands. And we go back to the first 20 chapters that we've, and 20 sermons that we've talked about. It means thinking like Jesus, retraining your mind, renewing your mind to think like Jesus. And it means doing the things that Jesus did, the spiritual practices that Jesus did. All that is connected to remaining in the vine so that we can love like Jesus loved. And this is a command. Now, a lot of times we think love is, uh, usually we think of a feeling, we think of warm fuzzies, right? We think of how it makes us feel. And I love ice cream. And I love, you fill in the blank. I love the Titans. I love San Francisco. Right, Oscar? I love, Oscar says, I love San Francisco 49ers. Lisa says, I don't love the San Francisco 49ers, but I love my husband. We say love all the time with, for all kinds of different things. And I'm not going to get, get into the, the Greek on the different, you've heard sermons on this, about the different kinds of love. We're talking about God's kind of love, agape love today. But if love is just a feeling, how can you command someone to feel something? Love is not just a feeling. Love is action. You can, Jesus can command us to love somebody because it's a choice. It's a decision we make. It's a frame of mind that we decide, I'm going to love that person. Even if they're the worst, even if they're the least, even if they can't ever give me anything back, even if I don't feel like it, I can choose to love that person. I think that's probably what Jesus did on multiple occasions. And we want to be like Jesus. It is impossible to obey these commands on our own. Can't do it. Jesus said in John 13, again, a new command I give you, love one another. How? As I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. The greatest testimony that we can give to the world is love like Jesus loved. The world will know that we are his disciples if we love one another with a Jesus kind of love. Not just each other in the church, but if we love everybody in the world with this kind of love, then they're going to know about Jesus and his love, and it's going to draw them to Jesus. There have been a lot of love songs, great love songs written. I had to do some work to narrow down our list to 21 a while ago. I mean, there's so many great love songs. And every generation, it seems like, pumps out an endless list of new love songs. Why? I think love is probably the most popular theme of songwriters and poets. Love is powerful. 
And we all know what love is. I want to know what love is. Did I leave that one out? Oh, man. We, we want to know what love is. We, we've got a taste of it. And the world wants to know what love is. And we could, there's so many great songs, just verse after verse after verse after verse. But if you look at God's love letter, the Bible, there are verse after verse after verse after verse of God's love. And what that looks like and how we can imitate that and emulate that and be that kind of person. How we can love like God loves, like Jesus loves. There's so many verses that could be verses of songs in Scripture, but there's one verse that kind of nails it down. And if there was a chorus, if God's love song were all these verses and we had one chorus, one, you know, the chorus is the part that sticks in your head of the song, right? That's the part you go around singing. You may, on the verses, you may go mumble, 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 but when it hits the chorus, buddy, it's full-throated and you got that part. And the same thing can be said for God's love song. There's all these verses, some of them which we just looked at, but there's one, but it is the chorus. It is the one that's memorized. It's the one that we can sing together because we know it by heart. And it's John 3.16. This is the chorus of God's love song. Will you, will you say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God loves so much that he sacrificed his own son. That's unconditional, that is selfless, that is sacrificial, and it is forgiving. If you're in this room right now and you've never fully embraced this, Fully embrace Jesus that God sent to die for your sins because of his love for you. We want you to experience that. We want you to experience the love that God has for you. that Jesus, The love that Jesus died for, for you. We want you to experience that. Look at, wake up. You with me? Everybody with me? If you have not given your life to Jesus, what are you waiting for? This is the greatest love known to mankind. Jesus loves you unconditionally. He sacrificed himself for you. He is selfless in his love for you, always giving. And he forgives us over and over and over again when we do not deserve it. It's here for you. It's free. We want, we want to help you grab onto this love and take it into your heart. So you too can experience the love that we've experienced. We want to help you today with that. We're, Dave and Mark can, are going to come on up here and they're going to get ready to sing a song. I think, do I have a response song up here? I can't even remember how I, how I uh, planned worship this morning. I'm so into this love thing. Yes, more like Jesus. That's a great song, more like Jesus. We want to be more like Jesus. And I'm going to be right over here, and while we stand to sing the song, if you want to know about this love that God has for you, come talk to me. I want to pray with you. I want to see what questions you have and how we can help you decide to grab onto this love that Jesus has for you. And if you're sitting there, and you say, well, I did that a long time ago. I'm already a follower of Jesus. But, but perhaps, perhaps, there's something going on in your life where you're having trouble loving somebody. Perhaps it's, it's the worst person. It's the worst person ever. Your enemies. And you're struggling with loving that person. Or perhaps you're struggling with being sacrificial in how you love a certain person or, or people. Or perhaps you need to forgive somebody. Somebody's done you wrong, and you're holding it onto it. And you need to be like Jesus. You need to love like Jesus and be forgiving. 
I don't know. But we're going to respond. We're going to have a song. I'm going to be up here to receive anybody. If other people come up, more than one, uh, some of our elders will come up and join me up here so we can all pray with you. After this song, we're going to have a time of open, open mic where anybody can come and speak to the whole church about something you, you need help with, or maybe you want to have a scripture to read, or you just want to give a praise or thanksgiving about something going on in your life that's not even related to the sermon. We're going to have some open mic time right after this song. Let's stand together, and we're going to sing, and we're going to pray. Lord, thank you for bringing us this message this morning of, of your unconditional love, your selfless love, your sacrificial love, your forgiving love. And we, it is a challenge for us to love people like you love us, to forgive people like you have forgiven us. But we understand the command. We understand to be like Jesus. We have to think like Jesus. We have to act like Jesus. And we have to become more like Jesus. Thank you for the love that you've given us. And Lord, we want to do a better job of loving the people around us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.